Dobro večer svima. Moje ime je Boris Buden, a odmah da vam predstavim našeg gosta večeras, Rastko Močnik, profesor, emeritus, nisi emeritus. Vidite, i u njegovim godinama postoji mogućnost daljnjeg napredovanja i savršavanja. Dakle, želim vam da postane emeritus. Dakle, profesor Ljubljanskog univerziteta, profesor sociologije, trenutačno u Beogradu na fakultetu za medije također, predaje, dakle, aktivni je i dalje predavač. U našim krajevima je poznat kao jedan od najboljih, bivše jugoslavenski najvažnijih teoretičara kada je riječ o kritici ideologije, kada je riječ o sociologiji i također uvijek je bio politički aktivan, aktivistički uvijek i 60-ih još i u umjetničkim krugovima i u publicističkim krugovima. Dakle, da skratim, to je taj tip našeg staromodnog sa javnog intelektualca, ujedno i profesora i teoretičara. Ovo je omogućio jedan projekt koji je pokrenuo Piotar Piotrovski centar za istraživanje umjetnosti u centralnoj Evropi iz Poznanja. Projekt se zove to ćete na engleskom War and Revolution, dakle rat i revolucija u istočnom, u centralno-istočnoj Evropi. Ukratko, počinjemo ovdje u Sarajevu, već znate zbog rata, sad ratka ponovo je veoma aktualna, nažalost, tema već godinu dana, inače bismo govorili o prošlom ratu, ali u ovom trenutku kad govorimo o prošlom ratu, također adresiramo i ovaj koji se zbiva u Ukrajini. Sljedeća naša stanica će biti u Bukureštu. Tema je revolucija. Dakle, svi se sjećamo još, mladi se ne sjećaju, ali uglavnom znaju šta je to pad Čaušeskovog režima, revolucija kojom je, dakle, potresena kompletna istočna tada Evropa, istočni blok. I tamo ćemo također razgovarati o toj temi. A u oba slučaja govorimo kako o ratu, tako i u revoluciji u kontekstu umjetnosti, umjetničkih, artističkih praksi. Dakle, naši studenti, odnosno polaznici koji su ili sa doktoratima, ili su kandidati doktorskih studija, bave se konkretno analizama umjetničkih radova, odnosno načina na koje je umjetnost reagirala na obje ove teme rata i revolucije u cijelokupnoj ovoj priči o postkomunističkoj tranziciji koja je počela 89. a kao što znate još uvijek ne završava evo ovdje u Sarajevu. Rasko moćnik vidite kapitalizam i rat. Kada smo se odlučivali kako da koga da pozovemo na ova javna predavanja da govori o ratu, bilo nam je jasno da želimo publici, nakako našim studentima, tako i publici omogućiti alternativne perspektive na oba fenomena, ali u ovom slučaju to je na fenomen rata. Dakle, da se odmaknemo od te priče u kojoj govorimo, kao što znate, o ratu identiteta kod nas, Srbi, Hrvati, Bosanci i tako dalje, i da pričamo u ovim našim diskursima koji su se potpuno zatvorili i koji se zapravo ponavljaju unutar sebe i onemogućavaju nam da zapravo shvatimo što nam se dogodilo ili što nam se tek može puno gorega dogoditi u ratu koji traje. Dakle, s jedne strane imat ćemo analizu suvremenog kapitalizma, pogotovo kada je riječ o traziciji, o tranzicijskim zemljama, odnosno odnosa između, mi to kažemo, ekonomija, ali kažem, nije ekonomija nego kapitalizam, jedna formacija, društveno-ekonomska, historijska formacija. Dakle, odnos između kapitalizma, kapitalističkih kriza, kapitalističkih odnosa i samoga rata. To je 
tema koju će otvoriti večeras razgovor moćnik. Sutra ćemo imati eksperta također za područje, za, za to područje, područje rata, uh, Iva Vukušić, ona je već ovdje, doktor Iva Vukušić koja je istraživala uh, sa ogromnim iskustvom uh, Haškog tribunala, istraživala je Bosanski rat i ona će otvoriti perspektivu uh, također takozvanih pal- paramilitarnih organizacija koje sudjeluju u ratu. Ne moram vam spomenuti koje su bile kod nas, ali vi znate da svaki dan u novinama čitate o nekakvom Wagneru koji vodi rat. Tko je Wagner, što je Wagner, zašto Wagneri vode rat, a ne države. Eto, to je, to je pitanje. Tako da ćemo pokušati tu temu otvoriti sa ta, te dvije ne neobične, da tako kažem, perspektive. Zato da vas potaknemo da malo razmišljate i da svi zajedno razmišljamo. Govorit ćemo na engleskom. Što je tragedija? <laughs> Ali je tragedija koju uh, možemo preživjeti, možemo koliko toliko uh, nešto učiniti. On uopće, on uopće ne govori hrvatski. Evo, bio je, bio je u Beogradu i rekao je da govori zajednički jezik i onda su ga ispravili da govori srpski. To su sad već tri. <laughs> <laughs> Sad ću objasniti zašto je engleski. Zato, eh, engleski zato, zato što je primarna ta naša ovdje publika, ovi koji su nas, da tako kažemo, sve platili, doveli, organizirali i tako dalje, to su naši doktoranti eh, koji dolaze iz različitih zemalja, dolaze iz Kine i ne znaju ove, ove naše jezike ili ovaj naš jezik. Rastko, ra, imamo simultano prevođenje Imam, imamo simultano prevođenje, a Rasko je još pogotovo u svojoj PowerPoint prezentaciji e, učinio što je učiniti mogao. Z, rekao sam namjerno tragedija. Ta tragedija se sastoji u tome da e, ovi, e, ov, ovaj naš zajednički e, jezik je, se, ali pazite, to nije samo riječ s našim, to je ja u Njemačkoj predajem već 15 godina, isključivo u Njemačkoj javisli na, na engleskom. Dakle, apsolutno, evo, imamo lingvistički imperializam, ali sad ćemo prvo govoriti o kapitalizmu da nam objasni kako funkcionira, kako funkcionira imperializam. <laughs> Dobro je. That, that linguistic imperialism Linguistic, American linguistic imperialism cannot be explained in English. This is the point. Okay, anyway. So, uh, počinjemo uh, ratko, to se ono kaže, tvoj podi je tvoj, izvoli. Hvala, Boris. Uh, pre nego što progovorim na imperialnom jeziku, ja bih želeo da zahvalim vama što se došli da me slušate, nadam se da neću razočarati vaše očekivanja. Biće puno govora o kapitalizmu, govorit ćemo i o imperializmu. Pokušat ću da na engleskom govorimo o imperializmu. O ratu će biti govora malo, sasvim na kraju, sa stanovišta ovih zavisnih postsocialističkih država. Jer ono što je, što je problem, što svi vidimo, što je intuitivno očigledno, je to da vode rat zavisne zemlje. Da vode rat zemlje koje su u sistemu svetskog kapitalizma zavisne, zavisne od centra, od imperialističkog centra. Imperialističkog centra. Tako da smo da smo u jednom paradoksnoj situaciji, da one zemlje koje bi trebale da se zajednički odupiru pritisku um, imperialističkog centra, vode međusobne ratove. Tako je bilo u Jugoslaviji, odnosno na području Jugoslavije, tako je sada u ratu u, um, napad, u agresiji Ruske federacije na Ukrajinu. Uh, još bih... Uh, Zahvalio Borisa Budena što me je pozvao na taj, na, na taj, taj projekat, a pogotovo zahvaljujem Hani Čurak za njenu sjajnu organizaciju i, um, koja, mi je, koja mi je mnogo olakšala do, dolazak u Sarajevo i, uh, 
i moj, moj boravak tu. Jako ja do, volim da dolazim u Sarajevo i u bolim bolnostima. Evo ovako. Znači, prvo ću malo sednut, onda ću, ću stajati i pokazati brojke i grafikone. Ako vas dosađuju grafikoni i brojke, vi samo recite pa ćemo, ćemo ubrzati eksplikaciju. Evo, ovako, ako govorimo o restauraciji kapitalizma u postsocialističkim zemljama, mi treba da znamo zašto, šta je to kapitalizam, šta je to logika kapitalizma. Sorry. Sorry, yes. <laughs> If we speak about restoration of capitalism in post-socialist countries, we should, uh, we should uh, examine the logic of capitalism, uh, why, it, uh, the, uh, it was, um, uh, why it so happened that the socialist countries, or better to say countries with socialist project, post-capitalist countries were unable to sustain their project and uh, uh, were led by the ruling coalitions towards a restoration of capitalism. The capitalism restored in post-socialism is dependent capitalism. It's a capitalism that is, uh, in, as it is called in certain uh, theories, peripheral. Peripheral capitalism as opposed to the central, uh, to the center, uh, central capitalism, the capitalism of center, which is imperialist. Now, if we speak about imperialism, we we need to show wh why the logic of uh, capitalism entails an imperialist perspective uh, dimension. Why capitalism is, by its own logic, forced to expand, not only uh, structurally, which means not only um, from uh, agriculture to industry to, uh, to health system to pension system to, to education, uh, but also geographically from uh, Western Europe, from Holland to, 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 to England, to, to the States, to the United States, Africa, to Latin America, all over the world. So, we shall first uh, try to explain very fast, very schematically this logic, and then we will look into the the performers of, performers of uh, different post-socialist countries, and we will propose a kind of schematic uh, uh, hypothesis of varieties of post-socialism. Uh, post there exists uh, uh, an eminent theory, which is called varieties of capitalism. Now we see uh, the, sh the graphic graphs and, and uh, numbers will show, empirical data will show us that there exist also varieties of post socialism, a very, a very extensive, um, uh, um, uh, a, a great extension of performance from the fantastic performance of uh, People's Republic of China. To, 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 to similar good performance of Vietnam, for instance, or Belarus, something very um, interesting, uh, to um, uh, less, uh, less uh, successful countries like Slovenia um, or, or Ukraine. Um, so that's, the, that's um, let's say, the synopsis, the abstract um, scheme of this presentation. Uh, now, um, uh, capitalism is, um, as a system, as it exists in the 16th century, uh, as a mode of production, uh, is uh, appropriation of surplus value uh, from the immediate producers, uh, and reinvestment of the surplus value into the next pro uh, process of production of surplus value. So it is, at the same time, a system that is based on the separation of immediate producers, workers, uh, from the means of production, and a system of unending, of uh, 
uh, of, of permanent accumulation, illimited accumulation of capital. Now this system, from the point of view of um, individual production units, or from the point of view of individual enterprises, presents itself as a competition struggle. Uh, and all those conditions that pertain to the logic of capitalist mode of production uh, were fulfilled by, uh, during the so-called transition, during the restoration of capitalism in uh, post-socialist countries. Uh, there was uh, introduced, the, the means of production were pro privatized, which means the labor, the immediate producers were separated from the means of production in Yugoslavia, where we, we, there was a self-management system. In other, in other post-socialist countries, the mode of separation was um, tra transformed. Where before the, uh, the agent of separation of the immediate producers from the means of production was the state. The state, the political bureaucracy to be, to be more direct, which means party state bureaucracy, was the agent that represented the interests of the society as a whole, or at least it pretended to, and it managed uh, the whole uh, process of social reproduction, which means that immediate producers were separated also in the, this uh, system of the so-called real socialism. But this, this um, separation was different. It was political. Now we have economical uh, uh, separation. Uh, and the next, uh, uh, so the first step was privatization. For the first step in Yugoslavia was uh, nationalization, etatization of property. Uh, uh, in the rest, privatiz then privatization is everywhere. And creation of labor market. That's an immediate necessary condition of capitalism, labor market. And, um, and um, the uh, productive units, the, in the enterprises were launched into a competitive struggle. What means that the successful companies were mostly sold to foreign um, or transnational capital, and the, uh, and the non-competitive enterprises, the enterprises that could not compete on capitalist terms, were, um, uh, were liquidated. Uh, and labor market was installed, so uh, the uh, economic uh, agents in post-socialist countries are now functioning in an environment of uh, free and undistorted competition. Now, if, now as I describe this, uh, this, uh, uh, these conditions of uh, functioning of the capitalist system, you can see that these are the conditions for uh, uh, joining the uh, uh, European Union and the conditions imposed by um, international agents like uh, uh, International Monetary Fund or World Bank. So, um, uh, um, the, the process of restoration uh, of capitalism was not and is not an entirely interior process. It's, an, it's a global process, it's an international process, and involved are not only local ruling groups, I don't say classes because that's an open question whether they are already classes, some, some, some are on good way to become classes, but they are ruling groups, let's say, and international organizations of the capital, of the imperial, imperialist capital at the moment. So, it's a complex pro process with uh, different agents, interior and international or global. However, as I said, the capitalism restored in post-socialist countries is a dependent uh, capitalism. It's not, it's not uh, a capitalism as it developed in, uh, in England in, uh, from the 16th century on, which, uh, or oh, let's say, Flemish manufacture and, uh, and Holland, Holland uh, capital, which became the central uh, central capital for 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 good two hundred years from the seventeenth to the eighteenth century, um, 
uh, kicked out uh, the northern Italy from, from center, transferred capitalism on the Atlantic and started the colonial uh, expansion of Europe, of Western Europe to be, to be more precise. So it's not a, a central, it's a dependent capitalism. What are the f main features of dependent capitalism? The main features of dependent capitalism are, um, are that sectors, particular sectors of, of um, um, dependent economy are not linked among themselves, but are linked towards the metropolitan, the more, uh, uh, metropolitan capital, uh, which means that uh, in the center, economies are organically um, structured, while in the, uh, in, in the dependent sectors on periphery, uh, the economies are disarticulated. That's an uh, Concept of this, uh, the concept of disarticulation of economy was introduced by Samir Amin uh, already in the 60s in his uh, first very important work, Accumulation on the World Scale. Um, Accumulation à l'échelle mondiale. It was, uh, it was um, originally published in, Fra uh, in French. Uh, so, um, the next uh, feature, important feature of dependent economies is that they are expert economies, they compete among themselves on the world market, which they do not control. It, uh, the world market is controlled by central capital, by the capital of the center of the system. So, if we now, from the, this was macro, Perspective. If you look from the point of view of individual capitalist enterprise, uh, we see that this enterprise um, uh, struggles to maximize profit. What does that mean? That means that uh, 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 capitalist enterprise or firm uh, 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 attempts to appropriate as big a portion of surplus value uh, that was pro that was appropriated by the capital as a whole from the labor power as a whole. So th that's Marxist, uh, uh, Marxist, uh, Marxist uh, um, great uh, theory from the third volume of Cap on the capital. Um, uh, it's the capitalist class that as uh, entirety, the capital as a whole, Gesamtkapital in German, that extracts. Uh, um, a, a surplus value from uh, from the working uh, masses, working classes, uh, and then individual capitalists compete b among themselves to catch to appropriate the, the biggest uh, portion uh, possible of this uh, surplus value, and this portion is called profit. So, so how do I, as a capitalist manager, maximize profit? Of course, by um, by increasing productivity of labor. How do I increase the productivity of labor? By introducing new and better technology and by better organizing uh, the production process. But not everybody has access to, 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 to new technology. Oh, after some time, everybody has access to the new technology. So this is not enough. This is not enough to maximize profit and there exist other ways, not so, not so, so sophisticated and very much at hand for the central capital. Uh, you can maximize your profit by hiring cheaper labor power, by acquiring cheaper raw materials, semi-products, energy, etc., by exter exteriorizing ecological costs, costs of infrastructure, costs of education of labor power, health, pensions, etc. What does that mean? It's, you, can, you can maximize your profit by delocalizing production process to a dependent country. 
This is called foreign direct investment. Great thing, all those post socialist countries are struggling to get, to get transnational capital to attract it, but it comes to make profit. It doesn't come for ph philanthropic reasons. On the other hand, those countries have unemployment, those countries don't have technology, not uh, up, up, to, up, up to date technology, they are, don't. Uh, master new ways of management, which means new ways of exploitation, etc., etc. So, big transnational capital comes to dependent countries in order to maximize profit. That is to extract the, the larger part of the of the surplus value um, uh, produced in those countries to itself, and then, of course, to reinvest it. But it's not necessary that it reinvests in the same country where it, this surplus value was produced. And of course, the high, the top managers take care of themselves and um, maximize also their income, uh, which is um, why some economists uh, call uh, our present capitalism managerial capitalism, because managers are becoming more important than owners of the capital, the action is, the shareholders. So, uh, <clears throat> so this is a nice picture of um, kind of schematic, but uh, the, 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 the capital system is, uh, is uh, uh, a hierarchical system that, um, sorry, <laughs> uh, is a hierarchical system that uh, you can see uh, that um, stru is structured in the, uh, in the center of the system. The center of the system is the so-called triad, triada. Um, uh, USA and Canada, Western Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and Japan at the center. Then you, there is semi-periphery, something in between, which means Eastern Europe, Central uh, some, uh, parts of uh, Eastern Asia and, and India, Saudi Arabia, uh, South African Republic, and most of the Latin America. On the other hand, then we have periphery, Africa as the most um, outstanding, Latin America, Central Asia again. And this is very kind of charitable map. It doesn't put uh, parts of the Balkans, parts of the Euro of Eastern Europe into per periphery, even though it could. So, we have the same phenomenon in, uh, in Europe. This is European Union, and it uh, is a regional map, not states, not countries, but regions. Um, um, uh, 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 according to the, um, to the um, um, percent of uh, poverty. So you can see there is a, um, there is an west-east divide and north-south divide. And some countries are divided within themselves. I, I didn't uh, draw a good line. Italy, for instance. Northern Italy against southern Italy. Um, Spain, northern Spain against uh, Asturia, um, sorry, um, Andalusia and um, the southern, southern western, Portugal too. So, uh, and of course, southeastern Europe. Uh, we can draw the same picture in a different way. Center, periphery, very interesting. Interesting parts, parts of parts of France, um, um, parts of uh, Spain again, Italy divided internally, and Eastern Europe. <coughs> now, what is um, very important is that poverty-stricken regions are located in countries with high inequality. Um, um, this, uh, so uh, this is uh, inequality, uh, 
inequality um, regions and this um, poverty stricken region. So you have very conflictual, contradictory social structure in uh, Eastern Europe, Southeastern Europe. There is a very interesting phenomenon. There is an island of um, egalitarianism, if I may say. I mean, that's an exaggeration. Czech Republic, Slovak Republic, and Slovenia are among the most, the least, uh, least unequal countries in the world. Yeah. So that's uh, basically an advantage, but um, few um, political leaders know or take it into account. Um, <clears throat> Now, let me illustrate the influx of, uh, of um, foreign capital into, into Eastern and Southern Europe by the automobile industry. You see that big firms come to Serbia, Romania, Slovakia, Hungary, Poland, uh, Czech Republic, and these are all great firms, transnational firms. There is no Hungarian uh, uh, automobile industry. There's no Slovenian. But look, these are numbers for Slovenia. That's an example, quite radical. There are, there are more than 700 enterprises involved in automobile industry in Slovenia. It contribute, they contribute to more than 10% of the gross domestic products. That's quite a lot. Uh, uh, they contribute to 20% to the export, but it's export within the same company. 40% uh, uh, to Germany. Uh, historians will see the old long durée processes coming back again to France, Italy, Austria, UK, US, to the center of the system. So they provide more than 40,000 jobs. So you see, this country is uh, blackmailed. If, if, if big automobile firms decide to cut it off, 40,000 40, workers out of the work, which means you, you should uh, multiply by four, for instance, you know, children, uh, wives, and you have a social problem, you, you have a... You have you have a revolution or a, um, or a fascist coup. So um, there is, uh, these are striking figures, and yet, and yet there is no properly Slovenian automobile industry. <clears throat> uh, so uh, there are, uh, these are figures of inflow and outflow of capital. Uh, and uh, the balance is always negative. Uh, Capital comes in order to, 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 to get more value out of the country uh, than invested. So uh, these are numbers for Czech Republic, for Hungary, Poland, and Slovenia, which means for more, for presumably more successful uh, post-socialist countries. And um, uh, these are Piketty's calculations of the outflow. What is interesting uh, for me is Czech Republic. Uh, Czech Republic is not... Um, uh, a poor state. It's not a country uh, uh, of miserabilism, uh, but it's a country that exports capital, that, uh, that is submitted to exploitation in, uh, in global terms. So we should, we should um, um, be more sophisticated. Uh, dependent development enhances a country's ability to yield profit for the transnational capital, it does not necessarily mean poverty of the whole population. It very probably means uh, rise of inequality, but not necessarily impoverishment. Um, that's interesting. So why, why it's interesting? Because this is the way how this uh, exploitation can go on, because population doesn't feel exploited, even, even though it, it factually is. Uh, so um, these are, uh, these are uh, I will present two theoreticians just, you know, so that you know where to look for, for literature. Uh, uh, two uh, theoreticians of uh, imperialism or center-periphery divide. One is uh, Samir Amin who introduced the concept of imperialist trend 
imperialist rent is a complex com uh, concept which, uh, which uh, entails the rate of exploitation being higher on the periphery than in the center, uh, and um, which means that a greater amount of peripheral labor is exchanged for a smaller amount of the central labor. Uh, uh, that's uh, the so-called unequal exchange, which was introduced as a concept a long time ago by, by uh, Argiri Emmanuel, uh, um, Greek-French uh, economist, um, who actually who's, who, who, who proposed a very nice a very nice uh, formula. He said um, um, incomes, wages. Are, uh, it is not that, wage, uh, that wages are low because countries are poor, but countries are poor because wages are low. So it's a, it's a nice formula. It's very difficult to act upon it, but <laughs> you can remember it. <clears throat> and the, uh, the other theoretician is Emmanuel Wallerstein, uh, whose um, theory is, uh, is interesting. Um, his idea is that Monopoly capital is uh, concentrated in the center of the system, while competitive uh, capital is uh, uh, at the periphery. Which means that um, when, um, your, uh, when our leaders, political leaders, uh, speak about competitiveness of our countries, of our enterprises, of our companies, they only reproduce the center-periphery divide. We have to be competitive because the whole market is controlled by, by, um, by monopolies situated in the center um, and deciding about our fate, about our li li uh, livelihood. Now this is for, for uh, this is um, uh, um, a, gra a graph that uh, will become important later. Um, if you read uh, newspapers, uh, commenting on uh, the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine, they usually speak about imperialism uh, of Russian Federation or about imperial um, plan of, um, of the um, Russian elite. Now, this is a simplification. It's a dangerous simplification because it, does, it blocks uh, analysis. Russia is not able to be an imperialist country. Um, it, it is at best a sub-imperialist country like Brazil. Uh, the concept of sub-imperialism, which means that a dependent a peripheral country develops a, enough of capital to be able to export it, to invest in, the, in its neighbors, and to get some surplus value from them. Uh, this concept was introduced by Latin American economists, uh, uh, concretely analyzing the case of, um, of um, Brazil. Brazil. And um, uh, for the students, um, a very important um, uh, Latin American economist, a Brazilian economist, was uh, Rui Mauro Marini, uh, who wrote in the 70s, a book called uh, Dialectics of Dependence. And this book was translated into English last year. And uh, it's accessible now uh, by monthly review press. Uh, in, it was launched, in, I think, in November 22. So it's a, it's a, it's a book uh, which is, uh, which is uh, written in quite horrible economic jargon, it's not easy to be, to, be, to be read. But on the other hand, Rui Mauro Marini was, in, was translated in Yugoslavia in the 80s, <laughs> so that, you know, this dependent cultural imperialism is a relative thing. Uh, it was, uh, his uh, texts were published in translation in Marxism, uh, Marxism Danas. Uh, that was a journal that, very interesting uh, journal who, who, who actually published all uh, the relevant theories, contemporary theories at the time when it was uh, published, so that if politicians, Yugoslav politicians, read those bloody uh, 
uh, tax, they wouldn't destroy the country. And as a, as a, as a, as a subtle um, addition to my aggression against politicians is that Milan Kuchan, the first president of independent Slovenia, was part of the editorial board. <laughs> member of editorial board. So, um, look, uh, this is a, a scheme of mine uh, which uh, shows you what is the difference of, between uh, classical post-Second World War capitalism and contemporary capitalism. Because post-socialist countries integrated into, into, uh, into um, a capitalist world system at a moment of a major transformation of the capitalist system, which is popularly called neoliberalism, which was called post-Fordism in uh, certain theories, but basically means no more the national economies. This is the situation of national economy. Uh, the, uh, the constitutive separation of, uh, of uh, national capitalism is the one uh, uh, the, the separation of labor power, both from the organization of production process and the means of production. So, the class struggle is among repre political representatives of uh, labor power, labor people, and uh, those of capital. And you can have social de democratic compromise in the center, in the Western Europe, uh, in the center of capitalism, or you can have uh, communist revolutions uh, uh, on the periphery, um, in the interest of labor uh, power, uh, labor power, la working masses. What became later is another question, of course. But you have this. This is a relatively uh, simple. Simple, uh, simple situation. Now the present situation is this: you have two separations. One separation is the constitutive separation of labor from from the means of production and organization of labor process. The other one is that the whole production process may be separated from the conditions of the reproduction, which are controlled by quasi monopolies. This is a scheme. Uh, uh, that is the, I developed from Wallerstein's theory. You have competition here, you have, uh, you have monopolies uh, uh, in the center who control uh, the, the world economy, and then you have different combinations of, uh, of, um, of, of this uh, secondary, uh, second, uh, second separation. For instance, you may have subcontractors in our countries who are independent firms, but producing for a larger quasi-monopoly, semi-monopoly in the center. That's automobile industry in Slovenia, or in Hungary for that matter. Um, that was uh, textile industry in Slovenia, um, higher, uh, higher uh, levels of pret a uh, semi-manufacturing, you know, very high quality, uh, working as subcontractor for Boss company, a uh, transnational firm. Boss then decided to, 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 to cut, to stop this kind of male shirts production. And 1,500 uh, workers in, uh, uh, on the Hungarian border in uh, northeastern Slovenia were. Regional, regional, uh, uh, regional crisis. Uh, but then you have, for instance, this uh, this uh, very familiar to you. Uh, this situation. This is a, a computer program uh, pro pro program worker. He has his uh, means of production. So his laptop or her laptop, uh, making programs. Uh, he or she can organize work, uh, her uh, labor process herself. But the only buyer of her uh, work is a big company who tells her, if you don't accept the conditions we are dictating, sorry, we'll hire somebody else. And she, 
or he does not control whether this is a realistic threat or whether it's, um, it's bluff. And it can happen on larger, on larger, on larger, uh, in larger dimensions. For instance, uh, Gorenia, uh, you, the older generation knows Gorenia boilers and uh, refrigerators, um, was a very successful company uh, in Yugoslavia. And um, like 10, 15 years ago, uh, there was a strike in Gorenia. And the owners, at that time Slovenian uh, oligarchs, said, we'll delocalate to Turkey. If you continue the strike, we'll, deloc uh, we'll uh, transfer the whole uh, factory to Turkey. And then an industrial sociologist from Ljubljana, Stanoje, Mira, Miroslav Stanojevic, published an article and said, they are bluffing. This, they don't have this type of skilled labor there. They don't have the infrastructure. So they cannot transfer it to Turkey immediately. It will take them six, five or seven years to establish a firm there and they will go bankrupt in, the, in between. And that was a successful strike. Now Gorenia is a um, high sense Ita uh, Chinese uh, uh, company. So, and the, that company probably can delocalize. De <laughs> so, what is interesting also in this schematic, uh, pre uh, schematic um, presentation of the situation is that in this classical situation, uh, the social composition of labor power is homogeneous or tends to be homogeneous, which means that you have on uh, sta so-called standard labor contracts, which are um, uh, politically guaranteed by the state because social democrats and socialists took care to, to introduce labor uh, legislation, and um, um, non-standard, which means precarious, labor relations are rare or in tendency disappear. So you have a homogeneous social composition of labor power, and you have a homogeneous, homogeneous, uh, um, uh, homo homogeneous income of the basic uh, unities of reproduction, which means of households. You know, uh, the father has ordinary work, a mother works in, uh, uh, in another firm or in the same firm, uh, um, the children go to public schools, uh, they will get probably higher education than their parents. They have a good career, career um, prospects. That's, you know, 50s, 60s uh, in Western Europe. And to a certain extent also in socialist, real, uh, in the countries of real socialism. So you have a homogeneous labor power, homogeneous income of, of, uh, uh, of households, and you have national culture. The ideological, the ideological frame is national culture. What does national culture mean? It means the same, in principle, the same standard of canonic uh, cultural values for everybody. Uh, access to, 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 to high culture, to, to, to all types of culture by everybody, and free, uh, and free uh, choice whether you go to, 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 to rock concert or or to symphony concert. So that's national culture. It's not, I mean, we can, we can uh, discuss about what is canonic, what, etc. But in principle, it's a kind of treasure, which is of course fetishized, but accessible to everybody. Now, in this situation, we have a, we, uh, we have a, a labor power, on the global market. We, we have um, platform workers, we, we, we have um, uh, organizations that sell labor power. For, you know, there is a lot of Slovenian uh, enterprises that only mediate, mediate labor power from Bosnia to Austria. They never see their workers. They are just going. And those workers don't know actually who is their employer. It's not 
the, the, the firm uh, for which they work in Austria. So no real uh, trade union organization, no, not, no real labor, labor rights. So uh, we have a, a labor power on the work market. Uh, you, you are competing with, uh, with um, uh, Bosnian workers are competing with Romanian workers and Romanian workers are uh, competing with Ukrainian workers and so on and so on towards the, ass, uh, the east, lower and lower wages, of course. So, um, and you, uh, uh, what we get is heterogeneous social composition of labor power and heterogeneization of household incomes. No more father and uh, mother uh, employed, etc. But uh, mother is unemployed because uh, Mura textile factory was just closed. The father is a precarious worker in uh, Austria, um, sent uh, by, by, by an intermediator. Um, uh, the, the son has finished uh, uh, his uh, his. Uh, um, um, university degree and is in involved, nobody knows what he is doing. From time to time he brings uh, a certain amount of money home, nobody wants to ask him from where. Uh, and the daughter is going still to school but selling, selling um, um, uh, black market cigarettes on free market. That's typical family nowadays, that's the whole household. So what has, what has to happen? This household is dependent on every bloody income of every member of this family. So you, it, you have to control all of them. You have to pull together their income. You have to discipline them. And how do you discipline your family, uh, family members? Ah, we know that. <laughs> That's a very, very well-known and very well-practiced Patriarchal authority. Now, if patriarchal authority, is, which means the oldest uh, male in the clan, it comes from Roman times, you know. <laughs> so, uh, 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 if this authority is uh, kind of uh, uh, weak and subverted, you call the Pope. You call you call pop posovete popa. It is Vestenica. You you call for the clerical authority who comes, you know, to those children and women and women and saying, listen um, to the authority which is by the grace of God, etc. And if this doesn't work, you have ethnical solidarity, very nice solidarity, but also ethnic control. And not only ethnic control, but also ethnic business. So, the so-called retraditionalization is a very contemporary, very recent phenomenon. Uh, and we now, uh, we, the cultures we now have is identity cultures, not, no more national culture. So, uh, so on this basis, varieties of post socialism. Um, you are maybe tired. We'll be go going faster now. Um, uh, this is a table. You are not going to read the whole. I won't let you. But <laughs> I'll explain what it shows. It shows the increase of grown national product from 1990 to, uh, to the last date we have, mostly uh, uh, nine, uh, 2021. Uh, the most uh, success, th this is success in capitalist terms, of course. It's grown, uh, grown national product. We are not speaking about distribution. Uh, so the most successful, of course, is China. The next is Bosnia and Herzegovina because the level of uh, the level of uh, where, when it starts uh, is very low. So you shouldn't be too too depressed. Uh, uh, then uh, Vietnam, it's Chinese region. You know, the same more or less the same system, the same regional uh, in, uh, integration. Uh, Litva, Lithuania. Uh, Estonia, etc. So this is the first leap. 
according to capitalist standards. Then you have a second league, Belarus and Russia. Then you have the third modest league, Slovenia. <coughs> Worse than Macedonia. Worse than Kazakhstan. <laughs> yeah, but you know, where it started, uh, it also depends on the level where it started. So, look, the saturated countries of the center, Germany, United Kingdom, um, uh, United States of America, France, have very slow progression. Because it's, and we cannot go into this question, but let's say it's saturation. Uh, and of course, losing of world hegemony to Eastern Asia. Uh, and then the last two, Ukraine and Tajikistan. Very depressive. Now we shall combine this table with the proportion of proportion of poverty, and I show. The, I have it in this uh, in, in this uh, form, but this is easier to read. So, poverty percentage of of poverty in uh, in particular post-socialist European post-socialist states, Moldova on the top. Latvia, very successful according to capitalist criteria, much poverty. Montenegro, R Romania, Bulgaria, Bulgaria is very poor and very unequal. So, Albania, Serbia, Macedonia, Lithuania also very successful but very poor. Uh, Croatia, Kosovo, Bosnia and Herzegovina, not so bad, look, not so bad. Close to Poland, Hungary, Russia, Slovenia, and China, according to the statistic zero. And this is this is uh, the Gini index, un, um, um, inequality index. Bulgaria on the top, the most unequal country uh, in uh, European post-socialism. Then China, very successful, uh, no poverty, but inequalities. Um, and then, you know, you see Bosnia unequal. I mean, what is over 30? That's an, um, a complex uh, Gini index, it's called. And this index is um, it's not very reliable. But if you go, uh, if, if you take a longer look, um, you know, you have the same measure for longer period. It kind of shows you at least the trends. Uh, what's over 30 is bad. Uh, so, under 30, Kosovo, Croatia, Moldova, again, poor, but not so, not so conflictual, let's say. Ukraine, that's a surprise for me, that the, the, the inequality is so low. And then you have the the, 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 four, the four least the most egalitarian countries, che che Czechia, Slovenia, S Slovakia, and Belarus. Belarus was not uh, uh, shown in other map because it's not a member of the European Union. But Belarus is something you should watch because it's a defamed uh, as authoritarian state in, uh, uh, in the media. It is actually run by a state bureaucracy, uh, uh, state bourgeoisie. They don't have the conflict between oligarchs and uh, state bureaucrats. They have a good alliance. And it's, I mean, forget free media. You have, you know, it's better to, to feed your family. Uh, so, there are uh, very different types of post-socialism, uh, there are varieties of post-socialism. And now, I have run out of time and out of your patience, I will only give you the point of my, uh, my approach. Um, the varieties of uh, post-socialism depend on the 
class relationships in, the, in, on, in those countries. In all, uh, in, uh, and I have here a digression into Yugoslav system, which I will skip, and I will uh, end with here. So in, sorry, uh, in, uh, in, in uh, all, all socialist countries, the <coughs> restoration of capitalism was performed by a coalition of political bureaucracy, party state bureaucracy, and economic bureaucracy, which means high management. And they restored capitalism by the means of state intervention. And for this type of introduction of capitalism, Antonio Gramsci, um, Italian Marx, theoretician and Marxist, introduced in his prison notebooks uh, the concept of um, uh, the Piemontese function. What does that mean? That means that in Italy, um, at the time of unification, of the creation of the nation state, the bourgeoisie was fragmented, scattered uh, uh, across the Italian peninsula, and not consolidated. S sorry? Uh, yeah. yeah, so, but it was not um, a, po a potent bourgeois class that could, uh, that could realize national unification and uh, introduction of capitalism. So, you have a very interesting situation on the side because it's latifundist, it's, it's agrarian oligarchy which is not strictly <laughs> capitalist. But in general, because there was no class to, 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 to perform the unification of the nation, of the bourgeois capitalist nation, the Piemontese monarchy uh, took over this function. Uh, and that's, uh, that's what Gramsci calls Piemontese function, the function of a state which acts instead of a failing uh, ruling class. And the same thing was in post-socialism. It was a Piemontese coalition of political bureaucracy and economic bureaucracy because managers were a fraction of uh, bureaucracy in socialist countries so, or countries with socialist project. Uh, so uh, when capitalism is, is restored or the conditions are fulfilled for functioning dependent capitalism. Um, a fraction, a fraction uh, struggle uh, between uh, uh, economic now owners, now capitalists, oligarchs, if you want, and state political bureaucracy starts. And the outcome of this struggle, that's a simplification, but the outcome will do, the, will um, will. Uh, um, de de determine the type of post-socialism, the type of capitalism uh, in post-socialist countries. And here I have a scheme. There are two, uh, the two extremes are China and Ukraine. So you have in China political bureaucracy, party state bureaucracy, that was able to control to a large extent only local domestic capital, but also to impose conditions to the transnational capital coming into the country. So this is a very uh, successful model. You have a superiority of uh, political bureaucracy over, over the capital. Uh, you have a, 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 a relatively, <laughs> relatively uh, successful model in Belarus, uh, where an alliance of state bureaucracy, uh, bourgeoisie, and, uh, 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 an alliance of uh, high management and state bureaucrats forms what some theoreticians call state bourgeoisie. And they control the uh, reproduction called social formation. Um, then you have a Hungarian type, where you have a 
coming co a, a, a coalition, um, well, I rely on Hungarian theoreticians. They, uh, they say there is a, uh, the present uh, regime tries to, uh, rather successfully to, to, to form a coalition between transnational and high domestic, large domestic capital, uh, 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 political bureaucracy and political bureaucracy. And they are forming, they are forming local capitalist class, which is called corruption. So, uh, <laughs> colloquially, but no capitalism without corruption. I mean, you are speaking about corruption in Hungary, but not about corruption uh, in uh, uh, in the United States. So, you know, this corruption uh, topos, uh, rhetorical rhetorical stereotype, uh, was in uh, um, old, in in the old good times meant to 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 uh, to uh, discredit uh, the the big and uh, and mean transnational capitals that corrupts local elites. Now, we don't hear anything about that. We only hear about, oh, those, those uh, Eastern European autocrats, um, oh, those corrupt regime. But, you know, that's kind of propaganda. So, uh, then we, we have Russia. Russia, very sharp conflict. Uh, between uh, 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 home capital, rentier class, uh, the, the ol uh, oligarchs that control uh, an, uh, um, um, natural resources, uh, <clears throat> and political bureaucracy. And in, the, in, in between, there is small uh, uh, domestic capital production, which is uncompetitive on the international international uh, market uh, markets. So uh, it is. Uh, uh, this small domestic production, which is more or less still bureaucratic management, uh, is um, an ally of political uh, party-state bureaucracy. So, uh, party-state bureaucracy controls big capital, and you have a, a kind of quasi-statist model. Uh, um, and then uh, you have Ukraine, where large domestic capital destroyed uh, um, uh, political bureaucracy. It, uh, it installed its, uh, its uh, puppets uh, as, uh, as uh, political uh, bureaucrats, as political leaders. So you have a, uh, you have a, um, a supremacy of uh, uh, domestic owners who are compradori rentiers, actually. They don't mind if holy Ukraine is going to be sold to... to to, to Western uh, transnational capital, as long as they can take their little part of, of profit, of surplus value, as a rent, as something that, uh, that uh, originates in their status, not in their productive capacity of organizing, uh, uh, organizing production and uh, uh, in introducing uh, new technologies. So that's... Uh, that's uh, schematic presentation of why uh, uh, variety, uh, uh, why uh, outcomes of restoration of capitalism are so different. And now, just as a footnote, I'm sorry, but I don't have a theory about the war. Um, <laughs> I have a hypothesis. Uh, yeah, but look, uh, this is uh, uh, this model we should not be Orientalists. This model I was describing here, you know, capital, private state, political bureaucracy, the masses, is the local variant of the contemporary capitalist model uh, pr uh, uh, proposed by Gerard Menil and Dominique Levy in the crisis of neoliberalism and other publications. They say our present societies are tripartite. There are three, three classes. Capitalist class, the owners of capital, managerial classes, and popular classes. The most important are managerial classes because capitalist owners are shareholders, are, 
uh, dispersed, mm -hmm. they don't have uh, political power. So managerial class is the decisive class. Uh, according to this theory, it's interesting. Um, and uh, it decides about the nature of society well, because it may form compromise to the left or compromise to the right. Uh, uh, compromise with capital and compromise with uh, uh, labor. Compromise with labor, compromise between the managerial class and labor, that's the 50s and the 60s in the center of the system. Um, 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 in other theories, it's called, at that time, the stakeholders were the dominant groups. The stakeholders are managers and workers in the same firm whose basic interest is that the firm that the firm uh, um, continues its existence. But then, from stakeholders, you have a shift to shareholders, the value for the shareholder, which means the deciding uh, factor of a success of a firm is its situation on the um, stock market. So, because shareholders will, st will, st uh, will start to sell their shares if, uh, if the firm is not well positioned on the, uh, on the, on the stock exchange. And that's why managers, uh, managers start to, um, um, to um, start to, to, to say, um, Sorry, to cheat. <laughs> uh, many start to cheat. That's called, you know, the, um, they form uh, imaginary little uh, little uh, firms uh, in uh, British Virgin Islands where they park uh, unsuccessful parts of their enterprise. Uh, so uh, uh, there, uh, that was analyzed, you know, the, uh, usually they say, well, managers are, are mean, they are corrupt, they have bad character. No, they are systematically, but the system pushes them to cheat, to cheat their own uh, shareholders and to present the success of the firm because if you present uh, that the firm is successful, it will have a high, high status on the stock exchange. So, um, Beyond individual psychology, the yeah, private, <laughs> private sins, uh, 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 we, uh, uh, we have a systemic, systemic push towards, um, towards this, uh, those practices. So this uh, tripartite, uh, tripartite uh, um, uh, structure of, the, of society is kind of know, moving towards uh, the same pattern. Uh, <clears throat> ah. Now the other part of the story, we were speaking about periphery. I will go faster now. We are speaking about periphery. Now we are speaking about the center. The idea that was proposed by um, the School of World System, World System Theory, and developed by Giovanni Arrighi, uh, is that um, um, capitalism moves in long cycles, cycles of systemic cycles of accumulation, and they are becoming shorter and shorter. The first was Genovese cycle, uh, supported by Genovese bankers, and uh, and uh, northern Italy, uh, also uh, silk manufacture in Florence. So the next is Holland cycle, then British cycle, at the end. Uh, American cycle. American cycle is coming to its end. The typical behavior of a uh, past hegemon, like the United States or, or British, uh, or, or, or Brit Brits, uh, is that uh, when they lose hegemony, they, they, they tend to, uh, to conserve, to stick to their domination by, me by, by non-economic means, by military means, for instance. So there are you, you, know, you may expect uh, there are, there are um, very 
persuasive, uh, persuasive uh, figures about the militarism of the United States. U.S. military presence around the world, very impressive. Uh, you, uh, uh, countries with the most number of U.S. bases, uh, number of troops, um, global military spending, that's the United States, that's China, India, Russia relatively, relatively not, not important, and so on. So we have, you know, an, in, an incredible disproportion in military strength, and that's the strength uh, the past hegemon now relies upon. So uh, these are uh, countries where the United States were intervening during their existence <laughs> in the world. So there are few where <laughs> there was no intervention. Uh, uh, this, uh, this is the frequency of interventions, and you can see that they, are, they were always important, but that in the last, in the last period, you know, they are very, very important. Um, and this is the expansion of the NATO. Um, it's not a trivial thing. You know, it's trivialized in the media, or at least in the NATO-dominated media, but you know, you have this expansion that first takes uh, Western Europe, uh, then Eastern Europe, and expands. These are the countries that are waiting, that are um, projecting their entrance into, into the NATO. Um, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Ukraine, Georgia. So this is not trivial. And this is my um, uh, little um, attempt to prove that Russia is um, a semi-peripheral country and Ukraine peripheral country. And the most important thing is Ukraine is the world provider of certain essential products, agricultural products. Ukraine supplies the whole world with agricultural products. Here you have the other... The, Sunflower oil, almost the half of world production in Ukraine. So it's an immensely important and strong country in its potential. Uh, uh, export by destination. It's Asia, Africa. In no way Ukraine is dependent upon Western Europe or European Union. Its expert partners are in Africa, in Asia. So it's a potentially independent country. <clears throat> the, other, the other dimension here is that why the uh, United States are nervous is that European Union is starting to take the Mediterranean, and the Eastern Europe as against uh, as against United States uh, and China. So I won't go into detail, but it's quite interesting. Now this is phenomenal. This is the slow increase of grow national product in Russian Federation and in Ukraine, and you can see that they are parallel up to a point. Ukraine is slight and slightly lower, because neither of them is, is very impressive. It's a slow progress. But then, 2000 and something, and 12, I think, Ukraine starts to stagnate. And Russia progresses very slowly, but still. What happened in, in, um, uh, in 2012? The, the, the International Exchange of Ukraine, the European Union, overtook its uh, partnership with the Russian Federation, export import. All the others are not so important, but look at this. So, 
When Ukraine started to integrate into Western European system, the European Union, not being a member but being a partner, its progress was stopped. It starts stagnation. So again, no reason to, to push into European Union, no reason, even good reasons to remain independent and autonomous. So, the, I, I, I try to show the same for Russia. So, the ruling groups lead policies in opposition to objective processes and, obje and objective possibilities of both countries. So why do they fight? Uh, the idea is that in both countries, rentier um, classes are uh, uh, ruling classes. The comprador uh, oligarchy in Ukraine, which means, you know, comprador is a term that was uh, introduced in the 20s by Marxists. Uh, it means uh, the... Um, uh, the uh, b uh, local uh, bourgeoisie that is uh, collaborating with international capital and actually it's an uh, executive agent uh, uh, in the place. And uh, 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 Ukraine uh, 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 comprador bourgeoisie oligarch oligarchs uh, are comprador are rentiers. Rentiers which means they are not productive capitalists. They take the, the part of surplus value regardless of where the rest goes. Um, the um, uh, um, oligarchs in Russia, even more so, they are rentier class. They exploit national resources. They sit on, on riches and exploit them. It's a totally parasitic class. And state bureaucracy is also a rentier class. So a rentier class, it's, the ideological and political horizon is territory, national resources, and, and population national uh, um, labor power to exploit. Both are to be exploited. So it's a standard old time of territory, population, we grab it. And that's why you, you have this um, war which is not imperialist, it's more primitive. It's, it's war for territory and for, for population, both to be exploited by, exploited by parasitic classes. So that's my hypothesis about this conflict. It's an archived conflict for territory, for people, both to be exploited. So thank you for your, for your um, um, attention. Pala Rastko. Uh, we are inviting you, dakle, pozivam vas da pitate in whatever language na kojem god jeziku želite. Možete pitati na engleskom, možete uh, započeti diskusiju, komentare. You can use English, you can, you can use Bosnian, Croatian, Montenegrinian, Serbian. That's like, you choose. Uh, Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for this great lecture, and it was one of the best I've heard ever in my life. So it was really, uh, really uh, uh, splendid. So I'm art historian, and I would like to um, use. I mean, uh, I, I'm using the similar logic uh, according to uh, to art history and history produ uh, production of uh, of art in uh, in Central Eastern Europe and uh, so to, to this periphery. And I would like to ask you several questions, but I don't want to kind of, you know, take the time because we have uh, time also for discussion tomorrow. But my first issue would be, uh, so uh, if you say mm -hmm. about this, 
de dependent capitalism, yeah? Dependent capitalism, uh, so peripheral capitalism. How is it organized, so uh, re related to the central capitalism? Uh, is uh, is uh, the, um, uh, sorry, uh, abuse uh, and uh, in the Marxist sense, taking place, so who owns the means of production? Because you said that the labor, in the central labor is exchange greater amount uh, uh, at the peri peripheral labor is exchanged to the lesser amount of the uh, central labor but who uh, how it is related in terms of means of production and what kind of what percentage of the means of production is owned by uh, owned by the peripheries that is my first question and the second question is more complicated and more complex but i would like to ask about your opinion because i know others uh, answers to it uh, how would you relate dependence, uh, codependence of capitalism and uh, nationalism and national structure of the world. Uh, um, is this one-way dependence or is it a both-way dependence? So this is the most important question that I had. So um, you, you are asking about um, uh, who is the owner of the means of production as um, <coughs> as a moment, as an important moment, a decisive moment in the relation between dependency and, and uh, central ca capital. And the second question is, uh, why national states? Uh, if I can simplify. Uh, so, um, um, I think the uh, most, uh, uh, um, the restoration of capitalism was um, a catastrophe for local economies uh, in ex-socialist ex countries. Um, most of the uh, firms, the enterprises, were non-competitive uh, uh, on the world market. It doesn't mean that they were uh, necessarily bad enterprises. Uh, it only means that they were, all, um, they were focused towards, um, diff towards different goals. They were not profit-making in the capitalist sense, but they were taking care of um, social services, which means education, health, pensions, social networks. Uh, they were oriented towards use value, which means providing the consumer goods for the population. I mean, they were not necessarily successful in this, but uh, the idea was not profit. The idea was use value and transfer of um, value towards uh, social services, supporting them. Uh, so uh, all this fell with um, uh, abolition of uh, socialist relations and introducing, introducing of, of um, capitalist relations. So necessarily, there was a need of capital investment to renew the economy on capitalist terms. The only local uh, agent who could provide enough investment capital was and still is the state. And then you have European Union and the neoliberal dogma that the state should not intervene into economy. Um, Brussels uh, bureaucracy penalizes state sub subsidies to, uh, to, um, to um, private fir firms. And um, to give you a concrete example, uh, Slovenian banks went into bankruptcy. Well, those Slovenian banks that are still owned by the state, very few, but the main one was State Bank, went into bank bankruptcy in uh, 2008 when the world banking system collapsed. First question is how deep was this? Uh, bankruptcy because the firm, the political elite at that time on power was interested to, pre pre to present this bankruptcy as very important. Very many specialists contested, but put this on, on, on the side. State intervention to save the banks was necessary. So they had to get, to get permission from uh, European Commission. And the European Commission imposed a condition which means, okay, 
you capitalize, you recapitalize um, the banks, but you should privatize it in five years. There was the same case in Netherlands where the conditions was open. You privatize it so in the future, and it still is not privatized, that bank. So, you have a weak political bureaucracy under the pressure of European bureaucracy, and basically they are allies. There are very few political bureaucracies that are opposing uh, the European Union bureaucracy, um, uh, Polish, Hungarian, I, would, I wouldn't say Slovak, and I wouldn't say Czech because uh, that was a kind of episode. So you have, um, you have uh, stronger bureaucracies in, um, in only two countries, willing to, to very modestly oppose at times the dict diktat. And you get a diktat because you are periphery and because you oppose socialism, because you have um, comprador bureaucracy on, on, in power. And, <coughs> and you know, the, the, this uh, um, European Union will tell you um, there is autocracy in, uh, in Hungary, there is a, a Catholic <laughs> Catholic autocracy in Poland, but it's not, it's, it's not this that bothers them. What bothers them is the politics, you know, is the con state control over the banks in Hungary, is the, is the conditions for transnational capital imposed by the government in Hungary, etc. Uh, that bothers them. And uh, what bothers them is strong political bureaucracy, uh, which means they have parliamentary majority. It doesn't bother them if there is parliamentary absolute majority in France, if Macron has it. No, it doesn't have it, but it, it had it before. Um, uh, but it bothers them it, if the political bureaucracy in Hungary is strong and if, if the ruling party wins the elections to have absolute uh, majority. The same with Serbia. Uh, so uh, <laughs> I was following this. When Macron lost absolute, uh, uh, absolute uh, majority in, uh, on the last elections, the Guardian, it's a progressive medium, said, was all in, oh, yo, yo, the political instability in France. Uh, the, Macron lost absolute majority, very dangerous. Uh, and when in Serbia, the ruling party again won, it was, autocratic rule in Serbia. I mean, it was on the titles, you know. So you have the same phenomenon, strong ruling party, but it's valued, of course, differently. And um, if, maybe later we can go into um, detail. Um, the so-called parliamentary democracy started to degenerate already in the 70s, in the center. Um, maybe in the 60s. I mean, you know, when the 68 revolution or what revolt broke out, communist parties in the West, in Western Europe did not support it. They were sabotaging it. Even though there was the biggest uh, strike in, in France, 7 million, 9 million or 14 million of labor, uh, power was on strike. There was a student revolt. But the Communist Party said we have to, to preserve the gains of the working class and manipulate the, the trade unions under their control. So, so uh, a Marxist uh, a sociologist, Nikos Polanzas, uh, developed the concept of authoritarian atheism, not on Eastern Europe, but in, on France, Greece, and United Kingdom. So that's about, uh, that's about who owns. Who owns? They are selling, uh, uh, because you cannot have a state, uh, state uh, intervention, you are forced, you are actually constrained to um, import capital, to invite transnational companies, and they don't come, you know, um, very easily. They, they put conditions. So destroy labor movement, destroy uh, labor uh, legislation. Uh, uh, ecological standards, um, built infrastructure, built 
uh, highways, build, uh, um, build uh, railways for us. It happened in Slovenia. It, uh, uh, there was a motor company from Canada, which uh, Magna, which uh, uh, was delocalizing from Graz, where labor power is, is better organized and more expensive, too, too close to Maribor, to, to uh, sit in, in, uh, um, uh, in Slovenia. And they put the conditions like, it should be here, you should, uh, you should uh, make a connection with the highway. Uh, it, it so happened that it was on the best uh, agricultural land, and the government gave up. Um, and um, it's now uh, stopped the production because uh, automobile industry, classical automobiles are no more uh, saleable, not so much. So, uh, that's about, uh, it's a systemic constraint that you import transnational capital and that transnational capital is uh, able to put conditions. And this situation is created by political, uh, not only economical um, pre uh, pressure by European Union. You are penalized if you don't obey. About um, national, national uh, states. In the first uh, stages of globalization, there was an idea that national state will more or less disappear. There was Tony Negri and, and Michael Hart, an empire, you know, anonymous, depersonalized uh, capitalist empire all over the world, etc. But um, national uh, states only um, changed their role. They are no more providers of, um, uh, of, um, of social services, of uh, or not in tendency. The tendency is that they are giving up their social role. Um, the, the, uh, state is much uh, is is becoming more and more repressive. You know, and what is now its uh, its uh, role is um, strengthening military and police potential, plus uh, controlling uh, labor power. Not necessarily with repression, but with legislation, introduction of uh, non-standard uh, uh, labor relations, uh, preca preca pre precariousness, etc. Or maybe with the social compromise, if the trade unions are strong. That's again a, a, an interesting, uh, Slovenia was again an interesting case in the 90s. It was presented as a successful transition, uh, which means no real conflict, no real uh, uh, pauperization, etc. But the, that was the result of strong trade unions. Trade unions in Slovenia were extremely, uh, very strong in the 90s, and they, uh, they were taking class positions. In 92, when the uh, neoliberal uh, shock therapy uh, was uh, actually accepted by the government, they organized a general strike with 400,000 workers participating of 600,000 uh, total force. So that was impressive. And of course the government pulled back and we were the most successful transition country, but not no more. <laughs> because now, you know, generations change, uh, trade unions lose their power because precari precarious uh, non-standard relations um, um, destroy their base and they are unable to know, uh, to, to find a new formula, organizational formula. And uh, we are no more an example of successful transition. Mm -hmm.